think what people ignore is that just because you come from a marginalized community in one sect doesn't mean that you automatically divorce yourself of other isms and other biases that you have. You have to work on those things. As a man, I work on what can I possibly be doing that could be sexist? What am I not seeing that someone else might be seeing? As someone who's ably bodied, I have to think about people that are dis you know, what kind of language am I using around people that are disabled, you know? As someone who does have a little bit of privilege now, they have an Ivy League degree and I'm gainfully employed and I have my own business, I have equity, I have capital, I have social capital, I now have to think about people who don't have that and, and be more grateful and be mindful of the things that I say. No matter where you are in your life, you're never going to be able to embody all of the marginalizations of everybody. I recognize that I'm not a woman. I recognize that I'm not disabled. I recognize that I, I'm English speaking and I'm a U.S. citizen. And I recognize those things. And, and, and the thing is that it's not to make your guilt trip yourself. It's more so to acknowledge these things and to be respectful and mindful of your positioning in, the, in different spaces. Mm -hmm. And that's what has been, I think, the hardest part in, in both communities and, and just throughout our country in general, is that we're, we're oftentimes lacking empathy. And so a lot of what I write about says, you know, I was frank one time, I said, it's not about a seat at the table. Some people are going to have to give up seats. If you're on a board and you say you want to make your board diverse and you're not adding more numbers, someone's going to have to go. And then there's the fight of who goes and why. And then there's the argument, this illusion of meritocracy. I earned this. And then that keeps us at a gridlock where people really think that they earned something and then they don't want to talk about privilege. And so people don't want to talk about privilege when it comes to their privilege. They'll talk about it in a vacuum. They'll talk about it abstractly. But when they dig deep on their own individual assets and they have to really reevaluate what they have to take in and take out, they're afraid of that. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is what's holding the conversation. Because those who do feel an affront are those who feel like they are the most triggered in the fact that they will have to give something up and they're not emotionally ready to do that. And that's why I think progress in this country hasn't went as far as it could because people are still, certain people that are privileged, that are more so privileged than others, are still holding back. Men are still holding back from opening doors to include women in the conversation. Straight people are still holding back from allowing the patriarchy to be disrupted with queer narratives. You know, we, there's a lot of that that is, that is holding on to these institutions that keep them fully in power. And it's a power dynamic and struggle. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a conversation of human character, essentially. Who is willing to let go of the power? Who is willing to amplify? Who's willing to make that commitment? And I don't think people are ready for that yet, which is why I think there are some people who read the work that are sober and say, you know what, I'm ready. I'm tired of fighting. I don't feel good about this. I don't like to see the division in that kind of way. I'm tired of seeing it. What does it take? If this is what it takes, then that's going to be better. Because that giving up is giving up to get to peace. 